Um, and then, so they get this manipulation where the motive is strengthened or where it's weakened. And then they're exposed to one of these two conditions. Now they think they're evaluating materials for a textbook. And we, they, we want them to evaluate how we present information to them. Half the participants um, are learning, are going to be told there's very few women in the top 300 Canadian companies. Um, now that actually represents more women than there are in the top 300 companies as CEOs, but we couldn't actually present the reality because it seems too extreme, um, too extreme to people. So some people are put in the few women condition, and then some are exposed to information saying there's many women. And you'll note that it actually isn't many women, it's, it's about a third, but again we couldn't go too far ahead there or else people would think that we were lying to them. So people are, have the motive strengthened or weakened, then they learn this descriptive information about how many women actually are um, in the business world. And then what we're interested in, first, in a separate study, we asked them simply, to what extent do you think women should be CEOs? That is, we're seeing, do people injunctify this norm? Do they think this should be the case? And next, and our next DV is really um, very interesting, what happens is the experiment ends, and the experimenter, this, this, this woman who looks about college age, tells the subject, or the participant, that she herself is actually an MBA student, and she's doing a market research course, and part of her credit is based on how she runs this experiment. And so she's at the professor, basically, to form her grade, needs the participants to evaluate her performance. And so what they do is they evaluate how competent, how well she ran the study, how professional she is. Then they seal this in an envelope, and they're told to mail it directly to um, the professor. And so this is going to form the basis of their grade in this class. OK, so what do we see? First, uh, this figure represents the effects of having this motive strengthened, that is, being in the threat condition, or weaken the no threat condition, um, on the extent to which people think women should be CEOs. What you see when the system justification motive is weakened, basically, is that um, whether or not they learn about few women or many women, everyone thinks women should be CEOs. And we have huge social desirability concerns here. Um, this is a one to seven scale, and say anything, saying anything other than seven, for example, on should a woman be CEO, is very um, counter-normative, you would think. When you look at the threat condition, what we then see is that when people's system justification motive is increased, when they learn that there's actually few women out there in the world, which is the reality in these, in these positions, they're now willing to not quite say, yeah, I think they should be. They're backing off that claim, um, and they're weakening it to an extent. And think about how amazing that is. When you, when you put something other than seven on this scale, um, it really is showing something, I, I think, fascinating. And now the question is, what are the consequences of this? Next, we look at what this does to people's evaluations of the experimenter, this woman who they think is an MBA student aspiring to be a female um, in the business world. Again, what we see when the system justification motive isn't activated in a context when people are all feeling about the same, uh, there's no effect of if they learn there's few women in the business world or there's many. But when you look at when the system justification motive is brought out and strengthened, people are actually giving this, uh, this research assistant worse evaluations that they think are then being mailed directly to her professor to form the basis of her grade in that course. They're referring to her as less likable, less professional, um, less competent, and that she did a worse job writing the study. Now, of course, the experimenter is completely blind to the, blind to the hypothesis and the condition. She doesn't know any of this. Um, and so I, th I think those results um, are quite impactful. And so just to revisit what we were predicting there, um, what we're seeing basically is, again, when this motivation is raised, people are turning this descriptive norm that there are not many female CEOs into what they think should be the case. And then that should is having these very important consequences. Um, one consequence is the derogation of individuals who have counter that norm. We have other studies where we show, for example, a really counterintuitive effect that if we ask you, should there be programs, would you vote for programs, would you support policies that help women gain entry in these business positions, what you see is that the more inequality we say there is, the less people are willing to support these policies. So um, you would think that the more inequality is, the more someone should think that you should have policies to rectify this inequality. But if we strengthen your motive to feel the status quo is the way things should be, then when we say there's more inequality, they say there should be less support for policies that change this. Okay, now in the next study I talk about, I'm again going to stick in the, in the context of gender inequality. Um, this time, I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of data from Canada. Um, in 2001, average wages in Canada were 38,800 for men and 24,000 for women. Um, and this isn't necessarily part of just some specific uh, context. Even among educated people like full-time university professors, there's a very large difference. And you may be thinking, well, this is because you know, this is changing. This was the old school, and men used to be paid more, but not anymore. 
even among young full-time university professors, pre-tenured professors, so there still maintains a large gender gap in salary. Um, now, if you're motivated to view that the system is fair and you're confronted with these clear group differences in outcomes, you basically have two options to explain this inequality that you see in the world. One is you could say this is due to systemic unfairness. This is because there's discrimination in the world and this is why women are being paid less for the exact same um, jobs as men. Or you could say, actually I think this is due to genuine differences between men and women. I think that either biologically or something essential about them is different that is causing men to do a better job and therefore be paid more. These are two types of explanations that could exist. Um, what we predict is that to the extent the system justification motive is increased, we think people are going to become increasingly likely to rely on this sort of rationalization where they say actually men and women are different and this pay difference is actually fair and less likely to say this pay difference is due to some sort of unfairness in the system or discrimination, something having to do with the status quo. So in the next study I'm going to ta tell you about, we basically test this idea and see if our beliefs in what are the causes of inequality um, are affected by increases in this motivation. So this is just what I was saying. As the motive goes up, people should be less likely to blame it on systemic unfairness and more likely to think these differences are due to genuine differences between the genders. Um, in this second study, um, again, we manipulate the strength of the system justification motive. This time we don't use system threat. We like to mix it up to show that our effects aren't due to any one manipulation, but due to the general motive. Here we manipulate the strength of the justification motive by what we call system inescapability. Um, the idea there is that we think one reason people are motivated to justify their systems is because they're basically stuck with them. Um, these things control their lives and it would be very difficult psychologically to feel that the thing that controls your life thanks, is completely unfair and unreasonable. Um, and we do have other data showing that is the case and so to the extent that that is the case, the more we make you feel that you cannot leave that system, that you're stuck with it, the more you should be motivated to justify it. So when we put people in high inescapability mindsets, feeling that they can't leave no matter what, we think they're going to be more likely to justify that system as a psychological process of rationalization. So people have their system justification motives strengthened or weakened this way. Um, oh, this is how we actually manipulate um, inescapability. Uh, again, they're reading something thinking it's a memory test. We tell them, whenever we want people to believe something, we have to tell them that it was discovered or, or claimed by Harvard University professors. <laughs> um, and so students read something saying, since the 1950s, a group at Harvard has been following international and political trends. And what they can tell you is that although the number of people that want to leave isn't going to change in Canada, it's going to be very, very difficult to actually leave Canada in the coming years. Um, that's our high inescapability condition. In our low condition, they're basically told it's going to be relatively easy to leave your country if you want to leave your country. Um, so you have the system justification motive increased or not. Um, and then all participants are given information regarding gender inequality in, the, um, in Canada. They're basically told that men, make, um, men pay off their student loans 60% quicker than women, uh, men get paid 30% higher, and none of this can be explained by performance in university or by job performance. So we make it actually very difficult on them to blame this on differences in the, in the people. Okay? And then afterwards, we simply ask all our participants to explain why is this difference there? Is this difference due to unfairness in the system? Or is it due to actually genuine, what we call natural differences between the genders? Okay, so the first thing to note is that when the system justification motive is low, people prefer to explain things um, via system unfairness than genuine differences. They'd rather say that this pay difference is due to, um, to something wrong with the system. We also do this open-ended and we can hear the creative explanations people come up with, but they'd rather say that this is due to unfairness in the system than it is due to a natural difference between men and women. Um, when we put people in the high system justification condition though, what you see is that tendency disappears. People become significantly less likely to want to say that the system is flawed, and significantly more likely to say, you know what, um, it's actually due to the fact that men and women are, at some genuine level, different types of people, and that's why men get paid more um, than do women. Now, whenever we run this study, we always get this baseline effect that people tend to prefer system unfairness explanations. I think there's a social desirability thing there, partly driving down scores in the genuine difference scale. Um, but also we do, like I said, try very hard in our manipulation to make it seem like it has to be unfairness. What else could it be? 